good evening. It's wonderful to see such a great turnout and many students, uh, which is really, really awesome. Uh, thank you all for, for being here tonight uh, to, to our event tonight, uh, sponsored by the Center for um, and Public and the People, the Department of History, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and the Environmental Studies Program. I am Henrik Schatzinger, uh, interim director of the center, and I'm also a professor of political science. Uh, these events are made truly special uh, because of your attendance and participation. To those who are uh, visiting us, <clears throat> welcome to Ripon College. Today, we are fortunate to welcome Professor Michael Bess from Vanderbilt University, where he is the, the chancellor's uh, professor of history and professor of communication of science and technology. Professor Bess is a specialist in 20th and 20th, uh, 20th, 21st century Europe uh, with a particular interest in the interaction between social and cultural processes and um, <clears throat> technological change. Tonight he will talk about uh, his brand new book, it just came out uh, two weeks ago, um, Planet in Peril, Humanity's Four Greatest Challenges and How We Can Overcome Them published by Cambridge University Press. In the book, uh, Bess identifies and analyzes four top mega dangers facing humankind. He also surveys the solutions that have been tried and why they have fallen short thus far. Of course, it is tempting to share some more details about the book, but uh, I will refrain from doing so to avoid having to spill the beans about some of the ideas uh, that we will hear about in the book. Uh, Bess is an award-winning historian of science and technology, and uh, he has been teaching at Vanderbilt University since 1989. I will just mention uh, his previous books very briefly. They are Our Grandchildren, Redesigned Life in the Bioengineered Society of the Near Future, Choices Under Fire, Moral Dimensions of World War II, the Light Green Society, Ecology and Technological Modernity in France, 1960 to 2000, which uh, has won several prizes, including the George Perkins Marsh Prize and the American Society, uh, <clears throat> from the American Society for Environmental History, and Realism, Utopia, and uh, Mushroom Cloud, four activist intellectuals and their Strategies for Peace, 1945 to 1989. Best has also uh, co-edited a volume of uh, essays on bioenhancement technologies and their special and their social and ethical implications. That one is entitled "Posthumanism: The Future of Homo Sapiens." Uh, Best has received fellowships or or grants from numerous foundations and institutes. So I will just list a few of them the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Institutes of Health and National Human Genome Research Institute, the John and Catherine MacArthur Foundation, uh, the Fulbright Research Grants Program, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, and the University of California's Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation. Uh, he's currently working on uh, three books, uh, which uh, I'm sure is keeping him uh, busy for a while. After the talk, which uh, is roughly 40 minutes uh, or so, uh, we will have time for questions from you, the audience. So, with that being said, please join me in welcoming Professor Bess. Thank you, thank you Henrik, for that warm introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming out and having me up here. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. In the back? All right. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe I wasn't holding it close enough to One, two, one, two. Maybe this one is a little bit. This working better? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I got my uh, first book review today for this book. I just, I, somebody just linked it to me. Um, and I wanted to just uh, share the way it starts out. It starts out, scared yet? Yeah. <laughs> Never mind Hollywood reboots of Halloween, Scream, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If you want true classic terror, read Michael Bess's Planet in Peril. <laughs> That's 
one of the more um, fun uh, uh, book, book reviews I've, I've ever gotten on any book that I've written. And it's true, I'm here to talk with you this evening about these four, uh, which I consider to be the most dangerous uh, challenges uh, that humankind faces over the coming century. And I'm, I'm going to be focusing less on trying to really detail what they're all about themselves, um, because my time is limited, so I want to really instead focus on what constructive steps we can take over the coming years, and even more so over the coming decades, uh, to bring humankind through this century in one piece. Uh, and I'll, I'll start by saying that in some ways, I'm more optimistic today about the prospects facing us than I was four years ago when I first started writing uh, this, this book that just came out. So in that, in that sense, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre would have been even worse if I had, uh, before I actually wrote this book. Um, but I should clarify what I mean when I say more optimistic, because four years ago, before I wrote this book, my feeling was uh, I was extremely pessimistic about the way uh, things look for the coming century. Uh, and what happened is, is I pulled together the material and researched it and actually started drafting the manuscript itself. Uh, I gradually came to feel that actually we have many positive pathways open to us as a species over the coming century. But it's a conditional optimism in the sense that we have those pathways open to us only if we make a lot of sensible choices over the coming decades. Uh, so perhaps it's more accurate to say that I'm less pessimistic than I was four or five years ago, because I used to think we were pretty much toast. <laughs> and uh, today, I guess I, the way I see it is there's the toaster sitting on the kitchen counter, uh, the bread's inside, but we haven't actually pushed down the little gadget to start the toaster up. Uh, we still have options, and that's better than the way this uh, project started out for me in, in the first place. So, uh, like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing each of these mega dangers, but I do want to say a little bit about, about each of them just to get us going. So the first, uh, obviously, the, the first one is climate change, uh, increasingly seen by the vast majority of scientists and science-minded citizens. Uh, as a major threat to the future well-being, and indeed maybe survival of civilization. We need to find ways to decarbonize our economies swiftly. And not only that, even if we succeeded in bringing our emissions, our net emissions down to zero, we have to also find ways to get rid of the CO2 that has already been released and is floating around up there and is already, and is gonna keep making the, the, the global warming continue even if we could bring our emissions down to zero tomorrow morning. So, uh, and I'm happy in the Q&A to, uh, to go on about that at greater length because I discovered new kind of technological avenues for removing CO2 from the skies that uh, I became quite excited about as the book uh, progressed. Nuclear weapons have been reduced in number since the end of the Cold War, but they're still sitting there on the tips of the missiles. There's still about 13,400 of them, all targeted, ready for launch. Nine nations possess these weapons today, and some of those nations are mutual arch enemies like India and Pakistan. On several well-documented occasions over the past 70 years, we've come hair-raisingly close to global catastrophe. I want to focus on one particular episode, uh, just very briefly, because I'm astonished at how many people don't know about it, and I myself only found out about it as I was doing the research for this book. But everyone should know about this story. So the, the story is, is, starts with um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 27, 1962, the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. What we now know is that one man, an officer on a Soviet submarine, prevented World War III from happening. One brave man standing his ground against the other officers who wanted to launch one of these, a nuclear torpedo, with the same pack, packs the same punch as the Hiroshima bomb, um, against 
the USS aircraft carrier Randolph, which was steaming nearby. Uh, and this, this, here's a photo of um, Robert S. McNamara, who was the US Secretary of Defense at the time, sitting at Kennedy's side. Um, in 2004, they made a documentary, and he recounted, because he knew what was going on, this is his gesture to say how close we came to full-on nuclear war with the Russians. And this is the man, Vasily Arkhipov, who was the one who refused to give, he was in one of the positions of, of leadership on this one submarine that had the torpedo ready to go, and he said, it's not clear to me that a war has started. And the other two, the captain and the political officer, uh, said, no, we have, to, we have to launch. And they went on for two or three hours, and he refused. And I think there should be a monument to him in every town around the world, because he saved us from nuclear war. And this was only one of the many well-documented episodes that we know, now know about when it became hair-raisingly close during the Cold War. The third mega danger uh, is one that we're all too familiar with, a pandemic. The virus running amok, wreaking havoc. What many people are less familiar with is the danger of artificial versions of these viruses. And artificial viruses and other microbes are being actively created in literally thousands of synthetic biology labs around the world today. And I'm not just talking about military labs, university labs, corporate labs, and even high school biology labs. And in some cases, even in people's garages, people who call themselves do-it-yourself biologists or biohackers. Uh, they're using simple yet sophisticated uh, do-it-yourself equipment that you can buy easily on eBay or on Amazon. There's very little active regulation of these labs. No single US agency monitors what they do or checks to make sure they're putting in place the proper safeguards. And at the international level, the safeguards are even weaker. Uh, so here I turn to a, a, an eminent authority, one of the founders of the field of synthetic biology, uh, a biologist at Harvard named George Church. And what he says, he's pretty bluntly honest in describing the, the challenge with these synthetic organisms. He says, for all the benefits it promises, synthetic biology is potentially more dangerous than chemical or nuclear weaponry, since organisms can self-replicate, spread rapidly throughout the world, and mutate and evolve on their own. But as challenging as it might be to make synthetic biology research safe and secure within an institutional framework, like a university, industrial, or government lab, matters take a turn for the worse with the prospect of biohackers, lone agents or groups of untrained amateurs working clandestinely or even openly with biological systems that have been intentionally made easy to engineer. The problem with making biological engineering techniques easy to use is that it also makes them easy to abuse. So this is George Church. Harvard. Some of you may be wondering why I list artificial intelligence, or AI, as one of the four mega dangers looming over us. AI poses no existential danger today. The worst thing it's probably going probably to do over the coming few decades is take away jobs from broadening swaths of the labor market, truck drivers to data analysts, accountants to office workers. What's more concerning is the middle term trajectory of this technology, like let's say three to five decades out. At that point, many of the researchers in this field of AI believe general purpose AI machines will become capable of emulating a much broader range of human physical and mental functions. And at that point, controlling these machines becomes much more difficult. Because at that point, we're dealing with machines that will exhibit sophisticated forms of human-like 
agency. Decision making, strategizing, forecasting, learning, adapting, networking with each other, competing with each other, or cooperating with each other, modifying their own software and hardware over time to boost their cognitive powers and physical capabilities. This is not sci-fi. They're already being designed to do this today, and they're just going to keep getting better and better at it as the years and decades go by. Why will these intelligent machines be able to do all these things? Because we humans will have designed them to possess precisely all these functional abilities. The more things they can do in an integrated fashion that emulate human behavior capacities, the more, the more they will, the better they will serve our, our needs and our interests. And so, uh, major nations and major corporations are all racing with each other today to endow these machine, machines with precisely these kinds of ever-growing and uh, not just narrow but general types of powers. And I think it's hard to overstate the significance of this from a historical perspective. Throughout past millennia, humans have faced two basic kinds of control problems. One is controlling the objects in the material world around them, the animals, uh, the things that surround people. Uh, and the other has been controlling the behavior of other people. Of these two, it was the challenge of other people that always proved far harder. Why? Because people are agents. People talk back, they deceive you, they go their own way surprise you, sometimes outsmart you, they change unpredictably on their own. So our species became quite adept at managing the behavior of animals or material things, and as a result, rose to dominance uh, on the planet. But where we've always struggled, and where we still struggle today, is in controlling ourselves and other members of our own species. And so now here we are, poised over the coming three, four decades, to endow an entire class of machines with a broad range of capabilities that emulate our own intelligent agency. Some perceptive observers have taken notice. In 2014, the Nobel Prize winning physicist Stephen Hawking joined with Stuart Russell, one of the world's leading experts on AI. AI designer, he's an AI designer. They issued the following statement. They said, quote, it's tempting to dismiss the notion of highly intelligent machines as mere science fiction. But this would be a mistake, and potentially our worst mistake in history. In the medium term, AI may transform our economy to bring both great wealth and great dislocation. Looking further ahead, there are no fundamental limits to what can be achieved. One can imagine such technology outsmarting financial markets, out-inventing human researchers, out-manipulating human leaders, and developing weapons we cannot even understand. Whereas the short-term impact of AI depends on who controls it, the long-term impact depends on whether it can be controlled at all. Although we are facing potentially the best or worst thing to happen to humanity in history, Little serious research is devoted to these issues. OK, so we have these four mega dangers. And even though they're all very different from each other, the one thing that they have in common is that they can only be addressed effectively with planet level solutions. Precisely because these four <coughs> dangers, these four technologies underlying these dangers, fossil fuels, nuclear machines, bioengineered microbes, advanced AI, they're so powerful, so human beings inevitably compete with each other to develop them, to reap the huge benefits that they promise to deliver. Nations, corporations are racing frantically to develop these technologies to ever more impressive levels of potency. And when you're in that kind of race, caution, transparency, restraint, and to take a back seat. When it comes to curbing greenhouse gas emissions, humankind has so far taken a few wobbly positive steps. But we're still far short 
of where the scientists tell us we need to be if we want to avoid a climate catastrophe. Every nation tends to say to its neighbors, you first. No, no, after you. Despite all the conferences and agreements and promises, the world's 193 countries are still reluctant to embark on the sacrifices and expenses required to make this urgently needed transition. The same goes for the nukes. Despite the reductions in the US and Russian arsenals after the end of the Cold War, we still have those 13,000 warheads sitting there in their launch tubes, armed and ready. And what's worse is that the Russians and the Americans, and now the Chinese as well, have been recently developing entirely new forms of weaponry. Cyber warfare technologies, hypersonic delivery systems for nuclear missiles, nuclear warheads, and outer space weapons. All these new military instruments reduce warning times, raise the risk of catastrophe even higher. So uh, even though after the Cold War people thought, oh, breathed a sigh of relief, oh look, they're, they're getting rid of so many of those weapons, the nuclear danger is as bad today as it ever was. And of course, I think now people are paying attention because President Putin is saying, yeah, I want to use one of these. Just a tactical one, just a small one, cute, little, tiny one. What about pandemics? One might have hoped that the COVID-19 experience would have prompted the world's nations to work together in developing new systems for not making this happen again. But instead, the opposite took place, pretty much. Nations hurled insults and blame at each other, hoarded vaccines and antiviral technologies for their own domestic use. Our global system of pandemic countermeasures and biotech regulation they're nowhere where they need to be, even now. And then there's AI. Back to Putin again. In 2017, President Putin, uh, sorry, I lost my place. President Putin visited a classroom of school children near Moscow. And what he told them was, Artificial intelligence is the future, not only of Russia, but of all mankind. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. I'm sure the kids were like. And even though other uh, leaders have not been quite so brazen in saying it this way, this is precisely the attitude that prevails among all leading nations, and in some ways among leading tech corporations, when it comes to regulating or reining in the development of advanced AI. Shortly after Putin made his remarks, the Chinese government openly announced its intention to become the global leader in AI by the year 2030. And China meant, backed up that promise with what uh, the, the leadership said. They allocated vast funding and talent to that end. So uh, make no mistake about it, the, the global arms race in AI is on, it's up and running. In my book, I devote a lot of thought to this problem of the dog-eat-dog -dog competition, the racing mentality, uh, because it tends to be the aspect that, in a sense, gets the shortest shrift in most other discussions about how to deal with these mega dangerous technologies. And the reason is simple. Most authors tacitly assume that the present day system of international relations will continue to hold sway over the coming centuries. Separate sovereign nations ruthlessly fending for themselves in the win-lose game of geopolitics. But my analysis takes a different tack. I maintain that the separateness of nations is already being blurred in fundamental ways by the economic forces of globalization. We live in a world of deepening interdependence and shared vulnerabilities. I therefore conclude that our best shot at tackling these planet-level problems is to gradually build 
a comprehensive framework of global cooperation and collective security over the coming century. Now, as you hear me say those words, you may be thinking, really? Global cooperation? Does this guy even read the daily news? And it's the same if you read up on a lot of the scholarly literature in political science and international studies. Some of the more pessimistic experts assume that creating a new framework of global governance is just a utopian fantasy. So they say, maybe a millennium from now if we're lucky. This is the assumption. But I find myself far more convinced by the other experts, those who argue that building a better global governance system is actually quite feasible if we put our minds to it over the coming decades. We're already farther along in this process than most people realize. And researching this book made that very much clearer to me than it had been before. And yes, it's true that the road ahead is definitely long and difficult, but this is a challenge that humankind is actually well equipped to take on successfully. If you think about it for a moment, 100 years ago, all we had was the vague rhetoric of the Hague conferences uh, and the pathetically weak instruments of the League of Nations. Today, we have a densely woven, multi-layered meshwork of institutions coordinating the myriad interactions of the world's peoples, from the UN, the International Criminal Court, to regional bodies like the EU or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to UNESCO, from business networks like the OECD or International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, to regulatory bodies like the World Health Organization, from anti-terrorist organizations like Interpol to military alliances like NATO, from grassroots groups like Greenpeace or Amnesty International, to volunteer bodies like Doctors Without Borders and Oxfam. And so it occurred to me at some point, if you were to make a fast forward movie of this process, these endeavors as they emerged and spread their influence over the past half century, this has really accelerated after the trauma of World War II. What would it look like if you were to make a fast forward movie well, it would look sort of like the self-organization of a young life form, like a new kind of creature assembling its sinews, its nerves, its vital organs around the planet's spherical core. In other words, global integration has already been happening for quite some time. All we need to do is keep pushing forward with this process over the coming century. And the key to my thinking here lies in the idea of purposeful incremental change. Some of the most profound transformations of the modern era have come about gradually through the dogged efforts, not just of individuals working hard, but of successive generations of individuals. What's possible? What is impossible? Well, it turns out that the answer to that question, the realm of the possible, is not a stable place. It changes from decade to decade as people's habits and expectations and assumptions evolve. Societal achievements deemed utopian in 1850, for example, true equality for women. Those achievements have started becoming legally the norm in recent decades, and they're on their way to becoming a socioeconomic reality in the coming years. We still have a ways to go, but we've, there's been a, a lot of progress. Another example, in 1950, the West European nations were still reeling from World War II, the convulsion of their entire continent. And this was following centuries of rivalry, and wars, and distrust. Yet four decades later, those same nations were signing the Maastricht Treaty, binding themselves together in a partial supranational union. War among the West European nations has become about as likely today as uh, aggression between the United States and Canada. My point here is a simple but fundamental one. Small, purpose-driven changes are kind of like compound interest. They can accumulate powerfully over time and therefore 
yield quietly revolutionary results. And that's where I pin my hope for the coming 100 or 150 years. In my book, I describe three time frames of change. Short term, uh, the next 10 or five or 10 years. Uh, middle term, the next 50 or 75 years. And long term, all the way out a century and a half. So just briefly, what are the short term, most urgent changes that we need to, the more immediate solutions that we need to put in place? What should we be trying to achieve right away today? Well, we can just go down the list of mega dangers that I've given you, very, uh, very briefly go down that list. We need cooperative pacts among select groups of nations for swift decarbonization of our energy systems. Every country has its own unique strengths and weaknesses when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. What works well for a country like France might not work as well for India or Brazil. So flexibility is the key. And accountability. If a dozen countries got together in this spirit and each offered to bring a set of tangible, verifiable actions to the table, this would be a terrific first step. So each country sort of would be making its pledge contingent on the other country's fulfillment of their own pledges. I'll do X, Y, and Z if you'll do A, B, and C. And this would bring that badly needed element of accountability to the process. And the participating countries, kind of like climate change mitigation clubs, you could call them, uh, that offer each other special concessions to reward each other for progress in meeting their goals. Oh, now I see that you've delivered on X, Y, and Z, so I'll grant you the following exclusive benefits. And the benefits could be incentives like trade preferences, streamlined access for low carbon technologies, lucrative exchanges of emissions credits. We can get creative about that. What about the nuclear danger? Well, here the short-term imperative is we need major arms control treaties to restrict these new and destabilizing forms of weaponry that I just mentioned, especially in cyberspace. It's basically the Wild West out there right now when it comes to cyber warfare. And the main danger of cyber warfare is that it can, it can very easily escalate out of control and trigger an actual shooting war. New treaties are the only way to reduce the risk of that happening. As far as global pandemic preparedness goes, we urgently need to beef up agencies like the World Health Organization. And here, there, uh, my book, I go into a lot of detail about all the different things that need to be done uh, to try to make the, uh, a better international system for regulating and preventing pandemics sort of nipping in, in the bud in the first place. And then there's the danger posed by unregulated synthetic biology and biotech. So we definitely have to keep funding advanced biotech research because it can generate discoveries that benefit us all tremendously. But at the same time, we need to set up within each nation strong systems of regulation so that the basic safety rules are put in place and enforced. And then once each nation has its own system of regulation, then they need to start talking to each other and creating networks of, uh, of shared regulation across borders. What about AI? Here, as I said, the immediate danger is not very great because we're probably several decades away from those all-purpose machines that can fully emulate human agency. So the main goal here is start now with promoting the kinds of safety research that this field so desperately needs. Most of the money today is going into projects that try to boost the power and capabilities of AI rather than its safety. There's only a few isolated researchers and organizations here and there that are devoting effort to this supremely important safety design problem. So think about it by analogy with the car industry. They think if car manufacturers were spending 98% of their money on building ever more powerful engines, and only 2% of their money 
designing steering systems and brakes. This kind of lopsided effort is not rational or prudent. We keep going like this, we run the risk of having extremely powerful, highly intelligent, self-modifying machines in our midst long before we actually know how to control them. So these are the kinds of measures I advocate for the short term. What about the more distant future, a century or more away? So here my book leaps far ahead, seeking to uh, en envision what, what our long-term thinking should be, what our long-term goals could be. And those final chapters are entirely speculative in nature, because if I'm projecting out to the year 2150, I have no clue what the world is going to be like in the year 2150. But my motto here, my, my sort of the reason why I feel emboldened to think that way is if you're heading out on a long journey, it's best to start with some notion of where you're wanting to go. If humankind wishes to head in the general direction of a more peaceful and just world, it makes sense to give some thought to how might that actually work in terms of institutions and practices. So what do I have in mind? Well, it's not a world government. <coughs> Most people, when they think of world government, uh, they have two kinds of images. One is a tyrannical super state along the lines of Huxley's Brave New World, or the feckless, anemic United Nations of today. So the emotional tone when you say world government is either fear or disdain. But it doesn't have to be that way. A new system of planet level governance could be built according to a very different blueprint, one that enhances our freedom of action rather than constrains it. And the main challenges here, as I see them, fall into six basic categories, and each of these gets its own chapter in my book. First of all, finding a way, creating a political system that allows dictatorships and democracies to work more constructively together. Second, revamping the UN Security Council so that it more accurately reflects the realities of global economic and military power. Today's Security Council still bears the mark of the year 1945, and uh, the membership is missing key players in world politics, and this needs to, to change. Then we need to find a way to develop a more equitable system of voting in the United Nations. In the General Assembly of the United Nations, it's one nation, one vote. And so the little island nation of Nauru down in the South Pacific with 10,000 citizens <coughs> has the same vote as China with 1.3 billion people. It's, that's ludicrous. So there has to be a way of weighting the vote so that they're proportional to the actual sway in world affairs of each nation. The fourth goal is reducing the gross disparities in wealth and opportunity that divide the world's people, peoples into haves and have-nots. No, no small challenge. Fifth is keeping the UN system rigorously accountable and transparent in its operations. And finally, maybe the most difficult of all, building robust instruments of collective military security and economic sanctions capable of dealing with nations that can go rogue, cheaters, fanatics. All this is obviously a really tall order. Uh, it's useful to remember here that uh, in this global federal structure that I'm envisioning, existing national and local governments would continue to do 95% of the day-to-day -day running of people's affairs. Only the truly global maps, military security, climate change, regulating mega dangerous technologies, these would be assigned for coordination by this revamped UN that I'm envisioning. Unfortunately for us, this transformative process is not going to be an all or nothing proposition, like flipping a light switch. 
even relatively small cooperative innovations can start making an impact right away in delivering greater stability and prosperity and security. So the good news is humankind does not have to build a full-fledged system of global federal governance in order to start working constructively on these mega dangers. We can start making a tangible difference today. But is this realistically possible? How can we generate the political will for this incremental restructuring of world politics? I think this is the defining challenge of our time. And here I believe we can draw inspiration from the partial success of two major recent initiatives. The environmental movement, the green movement, and the creation of the European Union, the EU. What's taking place with the green movement is not the drastic change of course that the, um, sorry, one slide ahead of myself. What's taking place with the green movement the original environmentalists of the 60s wanted to sort of do a 90 degree turn. That hasn't happened. What's happened instead is that there's been a, a deflection of the trajectory of the modern socioeconomic system down a different path. The original vision of a wholly sustainable civilization is far from fulfillment. But today, every sector of modern society shows the impact of green ideas. So the history of, envir of the environmental movement is the story of countless small, seemingly insignificant changes gradually accumulating into something deep and pervasive. And the same goes for the EU. It too has progressively evolved into a truly path-breaking institution. <clears throat> for the first time in history, a group of countries have voluntarily surrendered key portions of their national sovereignty They've invented entirely new ways to work together in their economies, in their culture, in their laws, in their education systems, in their labor and travel opportunities, in their environmental practices. In the years after 1945, the West Europeans said to each other something like this. If we look back over the past thousand years, we can see the steady consolidation into ever larger political units, starting from the clan to the village, to the city-state, the duchy or kingdom, all the way up to our modern nation-states. But does this consolidation into ever larger political units, does it have to stop with the nation-state? Or can it be pushed one step further to the supranational level? And does this process have to just happen on its own, or can it be deliberately fostered and encouraged by the people who are living it? Can the integration of our citizens and our cultures across borders, can we push it along? Can we speed it up? My assumption here is simple. If we do succeed someday in creating a far more cooperative order at the planet level, that story will be similar to the stories of the Green Movement and the EU in this one key way. It's going to be a long, slow process of advances and setbacks a progressive accumulation of myriad smaller changes in world affairs. That sort of idea. And here, there's an important piece of good news. Humankind is likely to experience some very strong incentives for advancing down this path of further integration both sticks and carrots, motivating us to move forward with this process. The sticks could end up being harsh, maybe very harsh. Penalties for, for partial failures could include a hotter planet, nuclear conflicts or accidents, bioengineered pandemics, or AI disasters. These are some of the terrible lessons we hopefully won't have to learn along the way. But the carrots, on the other hand, could be equally impressive. In the coming decades, whenever humankind does mark a partial success in building global cooperation, coordination, the benefits could be a cooling planet, an end to arms races and weapons of mass destruction, a phased reduction of standing armies, and if you could 
phase down the, the standing armies, that could yield a massive peace dividend that could be used to reduce world poverty, and a robust control system for advanced bioengineering and AI. These kinds of sticks and carrots, penalties and benefits, could impel major changes in the coming years, just as World War I and World War II impelled major changes in the 20th century. And I'm convinced that the pressure of these sticks and carrots is going to continue to escalate as the decades go by. So we're likely to find ourselves as a species very strongly motivated over the coming century. And I think this is a promising factor in our favor. So now, let me wrap up. Having said all this, the possibility of failure is ever present and very real. Building more effective instruments for planet level governance, it won't be easy. We can expect all kinds of disheartening setbacks along the way. And yet, yet, if we survey the landscape of the past century, if we tally up the innovations humankind has made in creating instruments of global cooperation, the achievements are really quite impressive. So we have every reason to work together in carrying that process further, knowing that our efforts are building towards something of deep and lasting impact. <clears throat> we may never get all the way to peace and justice, capital P, capital J, <clears throat> but we definitely have what it takes to gradually put in place a less dangerous, less violent, and more equitable world system. Let me conclude by saying this. These long-term proposals for cooperative global governance may strike you as utopian or unworkable or maybe undesirable for any number of reasons. But I do think it's helpful to open up a conversation about this topic among ourselves sooner rather than later, weighing the options, trading ideas, and just gradually giving the, sub the subject greater substance in our minds. It's like I said earlier, when you're heading out on a long journey, it's better to start with some notion of where you're wanting to go. I'll stop there and uh, eager to hear your thoughts and questions. So I'll just call on people if you have a response or a question. Yeah. How do you handle countries with leaders that do not have any regard for kind of global unity. So in my book, I have 11 fictional vignettes where I try to kind of make this, this can be very abstract, what I just said. But I try to actually say, what? here's a three-page description, sort of a, like a science fiction depiction of what the world would be like if this problem came about. And to my astonishment, the, the one where I address the question, how do you deal with rogue states? How do you deal with people, nuclear armed powers that are just misbehaving in very radical ways? That's the longest vignette. It's about five pages long, and it takes place in Russia. <laughs> and this was written four years ago. And what I imagine is the world being integrated enough into this kind of I place it in the year 2139, and the Russians have violated international treaties and developed secret weapons, and this gets discovered. And the rest of the world then has this powerful UN that it coordinates sanctions, economic sanctions. You can't attack a nuclear-armed great power, as we know well today. But if today the sanctions aren't working so well because the Chinese and the Indians and the Iranians are helping the Russians. The sanctions are known as broken or busted sanctions. So that undermines their effectiveness. But imagine a world where there was greater coordination and integration among many of the world's leading powers. If you could have those sanctions then really be focused, and that's the vignette that I depict. What happens then is, yeah, you can't compel them because they have nuclear weapons, but you could get a regime change from within. And that's what that's the vignette that I imagine for how sanctions and uh, you know, collective security and for, for military purposes, how that can get us past this problem of nuclear armed great powers that could behave very badly.
it's a bit of a hope to have a world where the sanctions, everybody comes to kind of in a near unanimity and nobody breaks them. But there have been successful episodes of sanctions like that. Sometimes sanctions have failed, and sometimes they've actually succeeded. Quick question. You mentioned integration, right? So would you disagree or agree that the UK was very integrated in the EU? Right? So my, my concern is that, I don't think how they come, but my concern is that if you're the leader of a country, even a democratic country, you have to follow myopic self-interest, which means following voters. And misinformation's everywhere, so voters are going to put you to do crazy, wacky things. Yep. The UK left the EU. They're suffering, but they're not joining in back anytime soon. Yep. So how do you respond to that? Because that's going to keep popping up more and more as the internet spreads misinformation. And that's not AI, that's people. Yeah, that's, that's people using information technology the information technology has empowered the spread of disinformation in ways that nobody fully understands or fully predicted. So when I look at the history of the EU, you give a specific example of yeah, yeah. Brexit. Um, one of the historians of the EU gives a wonderful um, sort of a parable for describing the history of how that has built up. And he says, it's like what happens, a procession that happens in Luxembourg in the little village of Echternach every year. Um, there's a, a saint there that nobody's ever heard of named Saint Villigord. And the entire village, villagers, they have kind of oompa brass bands going, and they march toward the procession through the town, but it's a particular rhythm. They go five steps forward and three steps back. And then five steps forward and then three steps back. And this historian, Richard Maine, says, that's what the history of the EU has been like. <coughs> Brexit was definitely three steps back. More broadly, how do we deal with um, demagogues, the, you know, the question of disinformation, misinformation? This is a, a huge challenge. I, I, I don't, I, it would be disingenuous of me to minimize it. it, it the problem is it, right, it, it, can, trying to control it runs you up against your commitment to free speech. So the only answer that I've ever heard that's any that's persuasive is you can't regulate that. You can only educate your population, like you, starting with elementary school, to be skeptical about what they read online. Teach the children early on to realize there's so much nonsense circulating out there. That, that kind of education for skepticism, critical self-distancing from what you, what you read and what you hear, um, that's one of the few tools I think we have. That's a really tough one. I, I agree. I don't have a good answer for it other than that. So you talked about um, some of the setback, or not setbacks, like partial failures and partial success. Yeah. Um, would you, well, solving some of these problems would lead to other problems getting worse, like getting rid of nuclear weaponry is going to make climate change worse, or, you know, trying to solve this pandemic issue is going to make artificial intelligence worse. Like, how would you have that? So, I've been thinking about nuclear weapons my entire career, and I've come around to the opinion that um, as much as I would like it, zero nukes would actually make the world a far more dangerous place if we, put it, if we tried to make it happen today. If by some miracle we were able to create a world where all the nukes have been destroyed, we'd actually be a lot less safe than we are today with the 13,000 warheads, because imagine, so suddenly there are all these nations that know how to build nukes, but they don't have nukes. So suddenly they're going to start behaving toward each other, maybe more using cyber warfare, or it's still the, comp the competition is still going to be there among them. What's going to prevent them in a crisis from very quickly having the materials ready to build the nukes? And they're going to race then to be the first to get them and maybe even use them preemptively against their enemies. That's going to be a very nervous world. So my argument is, yeah, zero nukes is only possible, but only at the very end of, if everything I have dreamed of as the most positive developments 
and what I've just described, if they have come to full fruition and we have stable peace, truly stable peace at a global level, then you can destroy the nukes. That would be the last edifice, the last brick to put into the edifice. And a lot of these, uh, I think, another paradoxical position that I take is that I became very pro-nuclear energy as a result of my research on this, because I found out there's an entire new generation of nuclear reactors that are being designed that are much safer than the ones that exist today, which are like 40 or 50 years old. The designs are very old. And they have what's, what, what the engineers call in, inherent safety. If something goes wrong, just by the physics of the processes themselves, humans don't have to do anything. They lose their cooling system. They, use their elect they lose their electrical supply. A tsunami hits, like at Fukushima. They just shut themselves down harmlessly. And when you actually look to see how many people have died from bad things happening at nuclear reactors, there's 450 reactors around the world. How many people have actually died? Well, if you include all the cancer deaths from Chernobyl, there's about 9,000. How many people die in airplane accidents? How many people have died during that same period? About 95,000. How many people die from uh, carbon emissions from coal plants? Millions every year. Something like 4 million per year from the respiratory diseases from coal plants. And then when you ask, you do public opinion polls and you say, What's your most scary, the, one, the type of energy that you least want? People always say nuclear. And nuclear, in terms of deaths per terawatt hour of energy produced, is right in there with wind and solar in terms of how dangerous it actually is with the old designs of today. It would be even safer with these new tiny modular designs that you can mass produce so they wouldn't be nearly so expensive. And Nuclear reactors don't contribute to global, global warming. And then you could use those reactors to power large carbon removal machines, which are now being invented as well. So you, you blow air through a filter, and it captures the CO2. You take it, you compress it, and you pump it a mile underground back to where the fossil fuels were residing for millions of years, and it sits down there inert, and you you're just grabbing it out of the atmosphere. It's a great idea, but it requires a lot of energy. And you have to have uh, carbon-free energy in order to actually power the machines that could do this. So that's the, the, the paradox is here. You mentioned nuclear power. Nuclear, I don't see a way out of this mess without building a lot more nuclear reactors of so this new, safer generation of design. Somebody who hasn't had a chance to yeah. So you've given a lot of institutional ways we could uh, improve the situation. Is there any way us as individuals can help the situation? Do you have any call to action that we as individuals, as students, uh, as people here, as community members, could take to potentially help our planet? Yeah. Well, with climate, um, I think we all have a lot that we can do. It turns out, um, and in my book, I sort of, I, I, I very much try to address that question, what can we do as individuals? It's a really good question. The one that we have the most say in is the climate. Because the nukes are going to be there for a long time, and it's, you, you can go and advocate, you know, reduce the number of nukes. You could vote for politicians who say that. but. Taking action on climate is something that each, each of us can do. You can also advocate for better pandemic preparedness. It's not even that expensive. The Gates Foundation has been funding better pandemic preparedness for a long time. But it shouldn't be up to prescient individuals like Bill Gates. This should be something that our government is doing in coordination with other governments. And they're not doing it nearly enough. It's very hard for us as individuals to design safer AI. But we could advocate, once again, for political representatives who say, we're going to fund AI safety research. It's not going to come out of the business world because they're racing to build ever more powerful AI machines. So there our power really comes as 
voting citizens. But with climate change, it can, you can start by eating less meat. You can start by driving a cleaner car. You can start voting with your feet, in a sense, changing your own patterns. When millions of people around the world do that, it actually has a sizable impact, which is not to say that ultimately it's going to require, it's going to require the governments to do things as well. But that's one area where we can have an immediate impact. Yeah. Uh, you briefly touched on this uh, earlier when you were saying when people think of world governance, they think of either the weak, feckless UN or Aldous Huxley Brave New World. Yes. Uh, with the Aldous Huxley Brave New World, there is a deep concern uh, among some people in this world of legitimately a Kabbalistic, satanic new world order. In my, in my own life, I was raised fundamentalist Baptist. I've met people who legitimately think that a one world currency is the sign of the devil. Now, how do you, how do we address these terrified folks who would be deeply skeptical of world governance? How, what do, do you address how you yes. would convince them? Yeah, um, what I say is the modern nation state really is about 350 and most 400 years old as an institution. When the modern nation state, when the nation state was first kind of starting to coalesce, the same, the French, the Brits, and in Western Europe, uh, initially, they're saying, well, wait, you're going to, we're going to have to be sharing roads and what, taxes are, if we're going to be paying taxes and it's, be going, it's going to be going to those people four valleys away who we don't really trust and they've been terrible to us in the past and people scream bloody murder at the, at the time. What happened was time went by and gradually what started to happen is a bigger sense of us developed. So the question is, can that happen? at a level where instead of just that being, you know, this little valley, that valley, it's nations looking at other nations and saying, what do we owe each other across the oceans, across the continents? I think you'll find that a lot of the people who hold those kinds of views maybe don't have any objection about sending charity to a, a famine in some part of the world where there's been a drought. Maybe they'll say, oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm religious and I believe in, you know, helping my fellow man. And yet, then, when it comes to the political side of it, they're, they don't want to share the same government. But I think the history of the, how the nation state evolved is an interesting dry run for what has to happen now at a, at a more global level. People were scared. People were horrified by what the nation state was bringing. And yet, it brought about the biggest pacification in terms of uh, the reduction of deaths and the, the ravaging back and forth across farms and valleys. And it was the, the uh, psychologist Steven Pinker at Harvard has written two books, Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, in which he describes the advent of the nation state was one of the big pacification breakthroughs in history. The number of more, the, the levels of mortality just plummeted. But of course, the other side was, now that there were nation states, they were building armies. And when the wars did happen, they were far more dangerous, dead. That's the downside. And of course, you know, it, there is always the risk. If you're going to have a, a federal world government coordinating the world's affairs, somebody could grab, try to manage to get a hold of that. And then that would be, indeed, a global tyranny but to that, I, I say, well, that happens within a, a continental union like the United States. We're a big country. We have this federal government. If some, you know, democracy only survives because enough people care to make sure that it doesn't fritter away and that somebody can't just take over and destroy the democracy. Vigilance is the price of continued freedom within a giant entity like the United States. And it will continue to be even more so at a, at a global level. So there's a real danger there that should not be just sort of dismissed. Oh, that's not going to happen. No, people are going to try.
to use this powerful UN instrument that I'm describing to their own ends. But that's politics. That's what the nature of politics is. And in a way, I'm saying we need politics to be conducted at a global level, like a world federation, but only with regard to those particular issues that have to be there where you actually need you know, military security, pandemics, climate change, where you need the global instrument of coordination. Everything else can still be run by the national governments, the state governments, the municipal governments all the way down. Uh, what role do demographic trends play in all of this? Uh, one camp may argue the real overarching problem here is overpopulation. That means more depletion of resources, uh, faster climate change, and so on. Others may argue it's the opposite. Uh, we're facing a demographic time bomb. We cannot afford our social safety net anymore uh, because people don't have enough children. So I don't know, are you, are you in one of those camps? Well, the good news is, if you look at the trend lines, um, the <clears throat> fertility rate, the global fertility rate, has been going steadily down. And what we have discovered is that as nations start to become a little bit more prosperous, they have a little bit fewer babies. And then they become a little bit more prosperous and they have a little bit fewer babies. To the point where some nations like France or Sweden or Japan or Italy, they have negative net fertility. Their population is shrinking. And if it weren't for people migrating in, their actual global, their total population would be declining. In Africa, it's in some, there are some countries in Africa where um, it's seven babies per woman. The global average now is about two and a half, 2.5, 2.6 babies per woman. That trend has been coming down. And if we can continue to address powerfully the question of haves and have nots, if we can be very effective at tackling world poverty, and I'm thinking that it has come down because extreme dire poverty has declined. You can, admit, you can actually have the statistics for that. That goes hand in hand with declining fertility. People then, oh, well, there's actually a government that has some, is going to do something for me in my old age. I don't have to have eight children so that they can take care of me when I'm old and can't provide for myself anymore. I can afford to have fewer children. What's interesting is this is never a decision that people, people don't say, oh, our society is more prosperous, let's have fewer children. But they, it just happens. People, it's an unconscious decision that people make. The births, the birth rates go down. So in that sense, it's a, it's a priority because more resources, you know, the, it's, the total, global total is supposed to get somewhere around 10 to 11 billion by around the year 2100 and then level off. And then maybe we'll need to start seeing if we can bring it gradually back down in a balanced way. Because 10 billion people is a heavy drain on the resources of a finite planet. <clears throat> but there's such a thing as smart modernity, smart growth. I, one of my books was on France and the environmental movement. In 1960, France was producing X amount of garbage every year, total. In 1990, France was producing 4X amount of garbage every year. But the garbage of 1990 was handled in a smart way. And so they're, instead of like burning the trash, throwing it out into a ravine, just letting it sit there, they actually were processing and recycling it and co-generating electricity and burning it in clean filtered plants and lining their landfill so that it wouldn't put, go down into the aquifers, four times as much garbage was much less harmful to the environment than one quarter as much badly handled. Smart modernity. And I think that's one of the things that the t where the technology, it's scary. I, I often portray it as being so scary. But it's also te technological solutions are there. And they should be embraced when, they're, when they can be shown to be possible like the nuclear reactors, like the smart environmental policies. And I think the, gl the global demographic trend, it's, gonna, it's going up because there's still 
baby for a woman, and it needs to be like 2.1 to stay even. But the good news there is it has been leveling off. So by 2100, it should level off, and then ideally we'll let it slowly come down. Are there? Yeah. What would you what would you say to the person that would say, with the exception of the pandemics, having people coalesce into ever larger and larger political organizations and business, you know, just having bigger and bigger thing yep. organizations is what has allowed them to invent those things that are putting us in peril. Right. There's a, the French have this saying, on peut pas arrêter le progrès, we can't stop progress. I'll go back to what I said earlier. There's a smart way to do modernity that um, uh, pays attention to the value of local cultures and traditions. So here, a perfect example is the EU, this big supranational structure which I see as being very promising for the future. Maybe not exactly the same, but kind of along those lines, on a global level. <clears throat> Within the EU, they, are, they take money from the EU and Brussels, and they pay for regional dialects to be taught in the schools. They call it a Europe of regions. The idea being, this, this supranational entity does not have to erase local, valuable community traditions. It could actually be something that keeps them alive even more and revivifies them where they, at the level of the nation state, they were being sort of discarded and cast aside. So to me, that, what, that, what that suggests is that if you're only creating the big globe-spanning structures for very specific targets of function, military, climate change, those types of questions, and you're still using these global instruments to encourage the valuable things that we have at the local level and preserve them, I would say that then you're not becoming kind of a faceless global bureaucratic monster. And the EU is doing this in a very smart way, I think. They're, what do you, what do you, you look skeptical as I, as I describe this. Well, no, you're, I mean, I just, to me that isn't what's happening. I mean, Maybe the EU is doing it different, but my experience in the U.S. is, yeah. in that, and I'm, I think I'm at least as old as you are, is as, as, we, as we have become more and more national, we become less and less local. Yeah. So the wonderful thing would be if we could enjoy the music from around the world and share each other's cultures, the good things <coughs> from this smorgasbord that is being offered to us through the global technologies and transportation, which lets us travel, cultural mixing that happens, and at the same time, cherish what's local and traditional. That would be a, a, a valuable goal. I, th I think we should make it more explicit than we, than we do, but we should fight for that. One last. Short question and brief answer, please, yes. Yeah. My my question is, you mentioned you have a couple books coming up. Yeah. Are you able to share a couple of things that you are looking into that most excite you? Perhaps uh, I'm giving you a little uh, opportunity to market to us your future books. Yeah. Um, I'm, doing, I'm teaching a class on world poverty this semester because I, I didn't know enough about it. It's something that's always preoccupied me. And uh, an idea came to me. What if we were to take the 300,000 richest people in the world and impose a wealth tax of, say, 30% on the annual wealth gain for those people? They're still getting richer. They're just taking away 30% of their annual gain in wealth. 
So they're continuing to get richer, but they're only getting they're a little bit more slowly. And you take that and you distribute it to the poorest two billion people on the planet, those who are living on $700 a year, two bucks a day, starving. So the very rich people continue to be rich. And the, the, the cutoff line, I, I did some numbers, looked around on the web. $30 million and up, all the way up to the billionaires. You could raise one trillion per year. What if we could find a way to have a global wealth tax, take that trillion every year, and transfer it to the very poorest two billion? And I thought, this is insane. Like, why did, you know, this sounds like completely utopian. But let me just play with this some more. So my students and I are exploring well, what are the compli complications of that? What would be the unintended effects? If you can make it happen. But it, it's just been very illuminating because it's, my students have been very smart in finding potential pitfalls and problems, not just how we are ever going to get the rich people to you know, not quash it, but what would be the unintended effects of large amounts of money coming in from outside into these, these nations? You know, would, would that really modify would it cause their currency to get messed up? Or what, what are these problems? Those are serious problems. But we're, we're, it suddenly it became clear that you wouldn't actually be hurting anybody by doing that. The rich people would continue to have their yachts. You're not you know, rush, running the Russian Revolution here. It's not Maoism. They still have their yachts. But the two billion people are having their income doubled every year. And so it can have a ladder out of poverty. This is an idea that I'm playing with for one, one of my three books that I've been playing around with. <laughs> All right, uh, let's thank Dr. Becky Morgan. So, uh, before you before you leave, uh, you know, thank you all for coming again. Uh, this is the book, and it's really really interesting. You look at the last, uh, you know, 55 pages of end notes. The uh, huge one of research that went into it. Uh, that's really super. I also recommend a few days after this book, this book came out. It's called Mega Threats by uh, um, the economist uh, Nouriel Roubini. He has 10 mega threats, and there's some overlap. It's a very interesting exercise to compare those two books. And uh, the very last thing, um, our next event will be November 17th. After the election, now what? Uh, location to you know to be determined. Um, Six thirty in the evening, we will have uh, Wisconsin celebrity uh, Charlie Sykes is going to be here. We're going to have Jesse Okoyan from the Capital Times. We're going to have Emily Fannin from CBS 58 Milwaukee. It will be a very interesting discussion. So we hope to see you again and have, um, have a good night. <laughs>